Hello and welcome back to Asian Cinema Season 2 and the finale of our Naoko Ogigami retrospective series with me and Daisuke Beppu. And before we even get to this video, which is our final thoughts and rankings of Ogigami's films, I just want to thank Daisuke um, personally, I guess, <laughs> through a video form. Uh, so actually a little less personally, but regardless, you know what I'm talking about. In video form, I want to thank him for... Uh, taking part in this and giving up a lot of his time to not only watch all these films but also to make I think eight or nine videos uh, for this series and even to go and watch some of those films that I can't watch or cover because they're not available with English subtitles. So this has been a great um, project and a discovery for me as far as just watching her films to begin with which started for me I think about eight or nine months ago at the recording of this video. Uh, the, the first videos of this Naoko Ogigami retrospective were filmed, I think, back in September, perhaps, of 2018. And this is currently, this video is February 2019. So it's taken a long time for this project to come together uh, as far as me filming and, and, and finishing off th these last couple of bits. But uh, yeah, it's been great and uh, I'm just really happy with how it's all turned out now. This was actually Daisuke's, um, not even, well, I guess it was his idea, but he didn't even present this to me. He just filmed it and sent it to me, which is his ranking of all of her films, which I hadn't considered or thought to do uh, to kind of cap off this series. But I think it's a perfect way to, to end our um, very lengthy discussion on all of her movies. So I'm going to go first, and then the very end of this video and the end of this entire retrospective uh, will be... Uh, Daisuke's rankings of her films and our lists are a little bit different um, and in some cases quite similar. Uh, there's not many movies to choose from of course so for me it's only six and for him it's only eight but I believe that his number eight and seven not to spoil it too much uh, are the two films that I can't see so uh, we'll be dealing with the, the the same six films as far as our top you know six even though for me there's only six what am i talking about let's get into it so at my number six we have rent a cat i really like this film i think that when i watch it again i'm going to enjoy it more i think that it's going to be one of the films that really grows and ages um like a fine wine because the more i think about it the more i like it when i first watched it i enjoyed it very much but found it to be lacking uh, in certain areas that I found her other films to be uh, brimming with stuff, you know. Uh, and as much as I'm a cat person, like I, I, I love cats, I'm a cat lover, and I enjoy that element of the film tremendously, but uh, for some reason it didn't fully connect or click with me to the point of her other films, but I still think it's a very good film. My number five is Toilets which I think is not as good of a film as rent a -Cat. So this is where personal preference plays into it. This isn't what, again, I say this all the time, it's never objectively a ranking. It's always subjectively. It's always my opinion. And uh, as, as far as what I prefer as a movie, what would I want to watch more? And Toilet, I just connected with just a little bit more. And I still think Toilet is a film that perhaps might be her least successful feature film that I've seen. But there are elements of it that I find more engaging than I do in rent cat I suppose. And I do like the characters a lot, particularly the the younger brother and the sister and, of course, uh, their grandmother. And the interplay between those characters. And, I, yeah, I enjoy it. I, I, think, I think that one's going to age better, hopefully, as well. But certainly I think that rent cat and Toilet are kind of, for me, her lesser works as far as the feature films go. But still films that have... Um, a lot of things in them that are worth looking at and experiencing, which leads us into my number four, which is Yoshino's Barbershop. It, it, about the, the group of young boys in the village where everyone has the same haircut. It's such an endearing tale, and it has a lot to say about conformity and, uh, and you know, kind of rebelling against the system, but it's done in a very fun way where the system they're rebelling against is, is simply just like everyone having the same haircut. You know, the stakes aren't very high here, but uh, you get really involved in it. I got really involved in it, and I loved uh, Masako Motai in the film. I think that she is a great um, Ogigami regular. I'd love to see her pop up in another Ogigami film, actually. And uh, she seemed to be something of a good luck charm for her for quite a few movies, from Yoshino's Barbershop to uh, Glasses and uh, Seagull Diner and Toilet as well. 
but I I just really like this one, and it reminded me of like those great coming of age movies that I grew up with in the, you know, uh, in the nineties. You know, films from the eighties and nineties, like The Goonies and like Stand by Me. Obviously, it's not quite as refined or as memorable as those films, but it has kind of dashings of that feeling of of boys growing up, and I really enjoyed that. And I think that it's a, it was a very good uh, for me debut from Ogigami as a feature film director. My number three, and this one's really tough, my number three and number two are really hard to distinguish because I think that they're both fantastic films and I love them both, but I think for me, my number three would be Glasses. And it's a wonderful film. I, I, I love it. I, I really do. And it's a film I feel like I'd have to be in the mood to watch. And I think a lot of people would have to be in the mood to watch this film, but it is such a special and unique film. Uh, for me, anyway, I mean, that there may be other films out there that have the same tone and are going for the same thing, but for me, it just felt when I watched it. And that's how I only how I can judge these things, is how I view it, my experience of it. And when I watched it, I'd never seen anything like it, in the sense that really nothing happens. Uh, and that's the point, you know, and it sounds so boring when you lay it down on paper, but it just works so well. And for me, it came at the absolute perfect time. I needed that film so much when I watched it. And that's often the case when it comes to timing when you watch a film. You know, you could watch a film when you're 15, you could watch a film when you're 50. It's going to hit you in different ways, but it could hit you in different ways if, if you watch it one week when you're 15, or another week when you're 15, or one week when you're 50, or another week and another day when you're 50. It all depends on your mood, where you are in your life. Things can change dramatically and drastically in your life. And so you're always reading things differently. Always, always, always. And to me, it just, it was like the perfect, it slotted in like a perfect piece of a puzzle to me that just gave me everything I needed that day and made me feel better about the the crap I was going through at the time. So I'll always have a special place for it. And I think it is a great film. But for me, the number two would be Seagull Diner. And they're both very similar in that not much happens. There is no real conflict for the most part. And you're really just following characters. And it's just about, you know, specifically Seagull Diner, I think, has more of an element of just showing what can happen when you have chance encounters with good people and you make good friends. You know, that that, that to me, like the whole film was about uh, unlikely friendships and how great and uh, nurturing they can be. You know, you have these three characters who come together, uh, all from Japan, uh, in Finland, you know, and again, that's another thing where it's like, uh, of all the places, the kind of small world that we live in sometimes where you will be on the other side of the world and you'll see someone who you know, and it's like, wow, small world. And then again, in Seagull Diner, they're on the other side of the world and it's like, oh, wow, we're, we're in Finland and we're all Japanese and we're all, you know, in this one place and we're all working in this diner, and food is a big element of it, and the kind of the, uh, the, almost the healing qualities of making good food, both in the act of preparing and making it, and then the satisfaction of, of, of eating it, and tasting it, and, it, and it's good, and and uh, how that can bring people together as well, as the, the diner slowly begins to kind of pick up business, and wonderful film, absolutely love it, and of course my number one, without a doubt, is Close Knit, which I still think is her, her great kind of masterpiece, and uh, after seeing it twice now, I think I can safely say this is in my top 100 films, I think, of all time. Just uh, a, an incredible drama that uh, hits on so many different levels from a woman who is uh, transgender and, and her struggle in life in that sense and uh, trying to be accepted. But I love how it, it didn't kind of um, put that over the top. And I've talked about it before, but I like how it wasn't all about that issue. It was also equally about a young girl whose mother is just not there for her and, and how she tries to, um, you know, accept someone else being her family. Uh, and then, you know, obviously the complications of that being a woman who used to be a man and seeing that through the eyes of a child who doesn't quite understand it at first and grows to understand it and accept it. So there's two things that go hand in hand there that make it a kind of a, a double punch of, um, of ideas and themes and um, I think a real important story. But beyond that, I just love the characters and uh, really just wanted the best for everyone in that film. And so I think that... Uh, yeah, Close Enough for me is easily the, the number one. And I hope she makes many more films. It would be nice if we could come back in, in a few years' time and talk about the next Ogigami film. I believe the next thing she's working on is a Netflix series that's stop-motion animation, which, to me, stop-motion animation 
coming from her, I think she's only writing it, but regardless, it feels like the perfect fit for her kind of quirky uh, personality that is clearly seen in the way that she makes her movies. I think that that could be a really cool uh, and interesting project, but I hope she continues to make feature films as well. And yeah, uh, anyway, this has been great. I've loved it. And finally, I will now hand you over one last time to Tokyo, whichever direction that's in, <laughs> uh, to Daisuke and his rankings and final thoughts on Naoko Ogigami's work. Uh, thanks, and uh, enjoy the, the rest and final part of this series. Greetings from Tokyo. This is Daisuke, and I have had the distinct pleasure and honor uh, thanks to Luke at Razor Wire Reviews of discussing the works of Naoko Ogigami uh, up to now. And so I am very grateful for the opportunity. So I want to thank Luke very much. Thank you, my friend. This has been uh, quite an honor and quite a learning experience for me. And I have learned so much from the exploration of Ogigami's filmography uh, through this process with you. So thank you so much for this opportunity. Uh, as a means of perhaps closing or capping off my comments on Ogigami, I thought I would just provide a run-through of Ogigami's works in the form of a uh, kind of a, a ranking in terms of my own personal preference. So let me go through the films uh, that I've discussed, her eight films that I have discussed, um, starting with my own, in, in the order of my own uh, personal favorites ranking. So starting with number eight and then going down to number one, which is my favorite Ogigami work. So if you don't mind, let me just share with you the films uh, in order of uh, my favorites, starting with number eight. Number eight is this one, which is Hoshinokun no Yume no Kun. Uh, this was the earlier work. This is a short work by Ogigami, which is around uh, one hour or so. And uh, this is a very uh, peculiar work. It's uh, number eight on my list, but that doesn't mean I hate the film. Uh, it is a very tender film. It is a film that is uh, still, uh, it's shot on video, uh, and yet there are tender moments between the characters which are quirky and uh, very memorable. Uh, and this is a very uh, interesting and uh, quite successful uh, film in many respects. So, Hoshi no Kun, Yume no Kun, number eight. Number seven is Love is 575. Uh, this is number seven, not because it's a poor film, as I said. I think this is a very uh, a moving film and quite an enjoyable work. Um, there are, I think, moments that I think uh, maybe, uh, maybe they are not necessarily Ogigami-esque per se, but for the most part, uh, this is a film that is about outcasts and how they interact with their environment. So in that sense, it is pure ogigami. So uh, this is one that is a, a joy to watch. So uh, it's number seven, but again, uh, it is a, a, a lovely example of ogigami um, and how she deals with characters in a certain setting uh, that is uh, in contemporary Japanese society. So love is five, seven, Five. Number seven. Number six is the film Toilet. Uh, Toilet. Now, this is the film that is uh, that is about a family, um, and they have a Japanese grandmother, Bacha. So, this film, I think, has many uh, many excellent points about it. As I said, there are things that I think uh, don't quite connect in the way that I, that I think they should have, but um, maybe that is uh, my fault and I should try to engage with it more. But I think for the most part it is number six because it is still a very stirring drama with strong and memorable characters at its core. So Toiretto, my number six. Number five, Yoshino's Barbershop. Uh, this is an early work by Ogigami and um, it also showcases the acting prowess of that great Japanese actress Masako Motai who would go on to uh, be featured in a number of other Ogigami works. And again, this is a very uh, a, an interesting film with a, a 
a very fascinating story that is again a fish out of water type of story and how uh, uh, contemporary Moors uh, conflict or collide with a so-called tradition. So this is another typical example of Ogigami's narrative style and it is a brilliant example and uh, uh, it's number five only because there are just other films that I think are just that edge it out a little bit but uh, still this is a, a lovely film, a beautiful film, uh, Yoshino's Barbershop. Number four, this is Megane and there we go. I think this is a film that is so uh, it has a lovely pace and it is so uh, thoughtful and it is well timed and it is a uh, lovely meditation on life and on lifestyle and outlook and philosophy. Again, filled to the brim with fascinating performances, um, but um, uh, at its heart it is about uh, how to approach life and it makes me so happy and it warms my heart. Megane, number four. Number three is this one, Rent a Cat or Rent a Nickel. And I love this one because of the, um, the, the main character, Sayoko, and her outlook on life and the way she approaches life and how it is a nice balanced look at this very carefree, uh, slightly quirky character, but one that is so uh, alive and one that has a, a lovely outlook on life. I would love to meet uh, Sayoko one day and, and uh, you know, rent a cat <laughs> from her if I could, because I think my life would be um, uh, so much uh, brighter uh, because uh, this is a, she is such a, a, a ray of sunshine and it's such uh, a lovely thing to watch this film it always puts a smile on my face so anyway rent a cat number two is seagull diner or kamome shokudo and this is the film about the uh, diner in Finland and so uh, there is a a lot of uh, there's a lot of stuff that happens, and then at the same time, there's there's nothing <laughs> nothing happens, and I love that. I love that combination. This is not a film that is focused on a story per se, you know, A to B to C, but this is about a feeling and mood and atmosphere, and it is joyous and it is also challenging, and also it 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 deals with certain aspects of Japanese culture and how Japanese culture is viewed, but also the importance of uh, of not just Japanese culture or uh, European culture, but also a universality, uh, a, a something, a thing that connects all of us, regardless of whether we speak the same language or not, or whether we are from the same country or not. And this is the power of Seagull Diner, and it Again, it is so balanced and it doesn't hit you over the head with its preachiness. It is a lovely film. My number two uh, favorite film by Ogigami, a masterpiece. And then number one, uh, Close Knit. This is the just uh, lovely uh, masterpiece from Ogigami. And it is one that is complex. Uh, it is uh, dark and uh, somewhat, uh, it's challenging in many places, and it is very life-affirming and heartwarming in others, and it's that balance that is uh, very tricky, but Ogigami pulls it off with such verve and uh, mastery uh, that this is uh, a sign of uh, a genius, a filmmaking genius. This film should be seen by as many people as possible. And in fact, all of her films should be seen by as many people as possible. I hope the name Naoko Ogigami is one that will resonate and continue in the conversation uh, going forward. Uh, and if so, then Close Knit should be one that is uh, a film that is part of that conversation. I love this film and uh, I will watch this film many times going forward and hopefully learn more from it uh, as uh, I, I too uh, grow in years. So Close Knit, my number one favorite film by Naoko Okigami. 
and that does it for me here in Tokyo so uh, thank you very much for watching uh, if you have any questions or comments please feel free to let me know or let Luke know and uh, other than that my friends uh, please take care and I hope all of you are doing well and cheers from Tokyo bye bye <laughs> hey, it's all right by me. <laughs> Apart from the fact he throws cans and calling into a tree. <laughs> yeah, he's really cool. Yeah, he's really cool. <laughs> but he's not quite as cool as you. Cause...